This episode is sponsored by Babbel. Top of the morning to you, Solo fam. My name is John Solo, and it's officially that time of year where I start my intros with Top of the Morning, and all the Irish people comment saying, I've never said that in my life. The arrival of March means a certain special holiday is right around the corner, National Meatball Day. Then, about a week after that, is St. Patrick's Day. Originally created to honor the man known for introducing Christianity to Ireland, but nowadays is simply considered a celebration of Irish culture. Well, as fun as it is to get pissed drunk with some friends while blasting, flogging Molly and Dropkick Murphys, no one's gonna pay me to do that, and there are several other aspects of Irish culture worth celebrating. Specifically, their folklore, which blends together with folklore from other countries, like Scotland, Wales, Cornwall, the Isle of Man, and Brittany to form the Celtic genre. If I'm not mistaken, the last time that we covered Celtic folklore was back in October when I explored the origins of Jack O' Lantern. So to make up for the five month deficit, I wanna try something a little different today. Instead of pursuing one single story or character to the granular level to try and figure out where it came from, I thought we'd talk about several of the terrifying and lesser known creatures from Celtic folklore. Before we get into it though, I've gotta shout out our sponsor who funded all the incredible art that was made for this episode, Babel. All right, Solo fam, we're officially in the month of March, so it's about time I ask, how are your New Year's resolutions coming along? What's that? You gave up after the first week and now you can't even remember what the resolution was? Hey, it happens to the best of us, including myself. The good news is you don't have to wait for our planet to finish another lap around the sun before you take on your next personal goal. And that's where Babbel comes in. Babbel is a language learning app that teaches real world practical conversations in bite-sized 10 minute interactive lessons designed by real teachers, not AI or learning algorithms like other language learning apps you may have tried in the past. Using award-winning technology, they can actually get you speaking in a new language in just three weeks, and there are multiple ways to learn. Traditional lessons, podcasts, games, videos, and even live classes taught by top teachers. As if that wasn't impressive enough, Babbel goes beyond the usual vocab word strategy and teaches you about the culture that language comes from, things like slang and traditions, so it really feels like you're immersing yourself in this new world. So if you want to join me in broadening your horizons and learning one of the dozen languages that Babbel offers lessons in, then I highly suggest you hit my link below. Not only does it get you 65% off your subscription, but Babbel now offers a 20-day money-back guarantee. So if you're somehow not satisfied or just too busy for lessons right now, there's no risk. Again, just follow my link in the description to take advantage and get 65% off your membership. Have you ever wondered where great artists like Leonardo da Vinci and Beethoven got the inspiration for their most celebrated works? How they created these masterpieces that resonated with so many of our species? Since the days of the ancient Greeks, artists have attributed their inspiration, at least in part, to the muses, goddesses of the arts who deliver new ideas and grant access to deeper levels of the human psyche, providing insight and wisdom that sparks the generation of new and creative ideas. Now, depending on who you are, these muses may take different forms. If you were an ancient Greek, they would be the nine daughters of Zeus and Nemesine. Or if you're Taylor Swift, they'd be your 19 ex-boyfriends. Those from the Emerald Isle have a more dangerous muse to look out for though. She's called the Leannan She, and the inspiration she provides is costly. A descendant of the Tua de Danann, the Celtic gods who were worshipped in Ireland before the arrival of Christianity demoted them to fairy status, she would be considered an East She. The East She were a fairy folk that were believed to live underground or in a parallel dimension that coexisted with our own. They were powerful territorial beings that the Celts took care not to anger, often referring to them in complimentary ways, such as the good neighbors or the fair folk. It didn't matter how nice you were to the Leanne and she though, once you accepted her into your life, you were doomed. You see, the way the Leanne and she operated is she would take the form of a beautiful young woman and give inspiration to a poet or musician by making him her lover. And through her love, she would share intelligence and creativity that allowed the artist to produce incredible works that were celebrated by his peers. His songs would be sung by bards in every tavern. His art hung in the halls and homes of kings, queens, and heroes. But ultimately, after getting the success and recognition he wished for his entire life, the Leanne and she would leave him, and so would the inspiration she provided. The artist would be left alone with the same sad skills that he struggled to break out with before the evil fairy had come along. And now, a shell of the great creator that he once was, he would die of depression. It was only after his death that the Leanne and she would return to drag his body to her lair in the parallel dimension. There, she would drain his blood, enjoying some for herself and storing the rest in a black cauldron, the true source of the artistic inspiration she offered. 
There is one way to escape her clutches though. W.B. Yeats, an Irish poet who wrote extensively about Celtic folklore, said that if the would-be victim refuses her initial offer, then she'll be forced to become his slave. Otherwise, her only chance for survival is to find another wannabe artist to be your replacement. Our next creature, the Kelpie, appears in several stories across the many countries that contribute to Celtic folklore, but traditionally it's associated with Scottish folklore and mythology. Great, now I look like an idiot wearing this shirt. The Kelpie is a shape-shifting aquatic spirit commonly found in Scottish legends. It can take many forms, including that of a human, but usually appears as a horse and roams around Scotland perpetually dripping with water. Kelpies like to lure their victims in by appearing playful and friendly, like James Baxter in Adventure Time, except he actually spreads joy with his talents. With the Kelpie, it's all an act. As soon as the victim lets their guard down and climbs onto the horse's back, they'll be physically and magically bound to it so they can't dismount. The Kelpie will then run directly into the nearest body of water, usually a lake, and drown its victim. And when the deed is done, it'll carry the dead lad or lass to its lair and eat them. The Kelpie wasn't picky either. It pursued men, lured in women. There's even a story about it trapping nine children on its back and successfully drowning all of them. It was close to having 10 children, but the last one didn't get directly on the Kelpie. He just stroked its nose. So when he realized he was stuck, he cut his finger off to free himself and ran away. Just like with the Leanne and she though, there is a narrow window to escape, one that doesn't involve dismembering yourself. If you have the sense about you to grab hold of the Kelpie's bridle, that headgear that horses wear, you could take control of the beast and from there have command over every other Kelpie. Not a bad superpower to have if you ask me, but if you don't think it's worth the risk of physically getting on the Kelpie, the good news is that as long as you don't touch it, it'll eventually see you're not gonna fall for its tricks and might even leave you alone to find an easier meal. There's a story from Northern Scotland about a farmer who is being harassed by a Kelpie that won't stop breaking into his grain mill and tearing up the place. And he finally gets it to f off when he puts one of his boars in there to fight it. The night after their first brawl, the Kelpie literally sticks his head through the farmer's bedroom window and says, Oi, are you gonna keep the pig in there or is that a temporary situation? And when the farmer says it's for the long term, the Kelpie leaves and never returns. A pretty interesting creature. It wants to make trouble and kill people, but as the stories indicate, not in a way that requires a lot of effort, or at the very least, risks putting itself in danger. Unfortunately for the Celts though, the last monstrosity on our list was a lot more murderous and nowhere near as lazy. Queer Honic, yes, that's really how it's pronounced, has gotta be one of the scariest creatures in Celtic folklore, which makes her obscurity all the more tragic. Also called the Celtic Fire Spitter and believed by some to be the mother of the devil himself, Queer Honic was the name of an old witch that appeared to be part humanoid, part demon, and part serpent. Whenever she'd emerge from her watery, swamp-like abode, she would wreak havoc on the local population, murdering travelers, burning down homes with families trapped inside, and the rare few who evaded her initial torment would be caught and devoured. One legend says she can inhale and swallow an entire cow from a few feet away. Kind of like Kirby. Celtic folklore treats queer Hanuk similar to how the ancient Greek myths treated their monsters that caused chaos in the countryside. She was ultimately hunted down and humiliated by a hero. The name of that hero depends on which story you read though. In a book called St. Patrick's Purgatory, we learn about a story where queer Hanuk is slayed by Celtic hero Finn McCool who shoots her with a silver arrow. After she died, her body was left where it fell and rotted away. Then a few years later, some jagaloo named Conan comes along and breaks one of her thigh bones after specifically being told not to by a magic dwarf. <sighs> Listen, I am not saying that you've got to do everything that magic dwarfs tell you to, but on the rare occasion that one warns you not to do something, you should seriously consider listening. Case in point, when Conan broke her thigh bone, a monstrous little worm fell out, and when he threw it in the lake, it came right back to the shore, but had regrown its original form as Queer Hanuk. Our hero, Finn McCool, uses his sword to pierce the new monster in the one spot she's apparently vulnerable, a mole on her left side. When he does this, she collapses to the ground, and her blood pours into the same lake she just came out of, turning it entirely red, and earning it the name that it still carries to this day, Loch Dur, the Red Lake. 
Another Christianized version of the legend replaces Celtic figures Finn McCool and Conan with none other than St. Patrick himself. While doing his whole ridding Ireland of snakes bit, which is most likely a metaphor for pagans by the way, considering that there never were snakes in Ireland according to the fossil record, he was also aiming to banish Queer Honic. However, she was able to evade his first attempt, so he called forward the fastest horse in Ireland and pursued her. It was a lengthy chase, and Queer Honic knew that Patrick would have to stop and get a drink for he and his horse eventually so she paused at every well she passed to expel her fire and poison into it. But Patrick, emboldened by his faith, refused to drink from these poisoned wells and prayed for guidance instead. Then he was led to Hawk's Rock, where he cut off Queer Honic's path to freedom and banished her from all of Ireland. The story goes that Queer Honic was thrown from Hawk's Rock Overlook and drowned in the ocean, which is kind of odd considering that she lived in a lake but maybe she was a freshwater witch? Personally, I kind of prefer a different ending where instead of banishing her, Patrick just impales her with his bishop staff and the blood once again dyes the lake red. But it was a little too similar to Finn McCool's ending, so I thought I'd mix it up. Now it's your turn to inform me, Solo fam. Which of these three beasties did you find the most fascinating? And which one would you be the most scared to find living under your bed? Let me know in a comment down below. Then, if you haven't already, leave a like and subscribe to get more mythology content delivered to your sub box every single week. Feel free to follow me on the socials if you want to stay updated on Messed Up Origins news, get hints about upcoming videos, or send me suggestions directly. Another really effective way of supporting the show is to join our Patreon. Even $1 helps and gives you access to the Messed Up Origins Discord, where we do exclusive live streams and game nights. And finally, follow Gunther for no other reason than to add some cuteness to your timeline. He so does not want to be here right now. I interrupted his nap in the sun, so I can't really blame him. I'll see you all again next week when I cover the origins of Dr. Facilier and his voodoo shenanigans. Until then, my name is John Solo, and remember, John shot first.